I think your product looks good. Yeah. Yeah. I think. Um, yeah. I mean, I think you've. Yeah. I, I mean, like, we wouldn't be on this call if I didn't think that. <laughs> Let's put it that way. Like, yeah. I went and did some research, looked at it, looked at your product, compared it to competitors. And, yeah, I see that, you know, you guys have taken the time to solve some pain points. And then, like, there's the fact that there's been several e-scooters successfully happening on Amazon recently. And even if you go back a few years, I think, yeah, you guys are have a good chance at a successful Kickstarter campaign for sure, which is primarily based on the product. Man, if you're doing a Kickstarter and it's just going to be Europe, I think you're really hindering your Kickstarter success. And I'm not sure, I'm not sure if, I mean, it, it would depend on how much uh, pre-campaigning you do, but so like I went in and researched several different e-scooter campaigns that have existed and succeeded on Kickstarter, most of their backers by far are coming from the United States. Mm. So, and that's, that's, also you can, one, you the, can, what is the name again? The last one I sent you, is it also, uh, because there's this one Spanish one. Let me, let me just check. Um, so I'll pull up. You can, so by the way, when you are on a Kickstarter campaign, if you click the community tab, and scroll down, yeah. you can see where most of their backers have come from. And you, yeah, it's the United States. Oh, shit. And then Germany and then UK. So, yeah, man, I, I think if you go just Europe, you're losing, you're going to lose most of the backers that would be from the United States. And that's just, that's not scooters. That's just Kickstarter in general. Like, if you go look at pretty much any successful Kickstarter, most of the backers will be from the U.S. I'm sure you can find some where there is another country in top um, backer spot, but most of them are just going to be U.S. because that's where uh, that's just where most people are most familiar and spending their money on Kickstarter projects. Yeah, yeah, I see that. Yeah, by far is wow. Yeah, it's really the biggest by far. It's like almost double of, of Germany, which is the second biggest in the list. Yeah. And if you, and you can go if you go look into the other campaigns too, it's just going to show you the same thing. And then if you look down at the bottom even more, where it says new backers versus returning backers, um, this isn't exact by any means, but you can kind of look at returning backers as like potential organic um, backers that you could get because these are people that already know about Kickstarter campaigns. They've backed one in the future. They backed this one. They're likely to back more. Uh, or sorry, I meant to say in the past, likely to back more in the future. Yeah, new, yeah, new backers yeah. is is maybe going to be you know, um, you know. The new backers is really the, the all the pre campaigning effort you put in. This kind of the ratio you mean? Yeah, right? and there can definitely be you know new people browsing that find your product and they end up in this number. But yeah, you can kind of look at it that way. So um, okay, and and so when I went and looked through all these campaigns, these e scooter campaigns, and where the backers are coming from mostly returning backers which is a good sign because that means that you at least have a chance of getting some organic success just just because you launched on the platform and the people that are browsing like your product like i think there is a bit of that there which is not always the case for every product on kickstarter um but then okay. the downside is what i already said is that most of those i think are going to be united states people yeah yeah. Sorry, okay. I know that's not what what, we, what you want to hear, but I just yeah, think that's no, important exactly. to point I'm just, out. I'm just making. Dude, did did uh, you actually check that? Because that's actually a key point. You know, like how I did. How, how did, do they make the do they make the clients pay for the shipping? Yep. So uh, I'll that, point I'll point that out. That's a good thing to talk on. Um, people on Kickstarter are very accustomed to having to pay for shipping. So if if like they're, they're if, custom if, to, to do have to pay for shipping. Yeah, yeah. Well, you you get to decide wow. if you charge them or not. But they are used to having to pay for shipping. So like if you charge people fifty bucks or sixty bucks or whatever to ship the scooter to the U.S., I'd do that, man. And and I don't think people you know people aren't going to be like, wow, you're charging me sixty bucks to import you know to bring this into my country. They're not going to look at it like that. You'll have to clarify maybe that you know. And and it'll I'm sure you'll on the campaign it'll show that you're launching from Europe, 
but yeah, you'd, you'd want to specify that storyline you want to push, you know, like German quality, German engineering, blah yeah, blah, yeah. blah. Yeah, yeah. So it's like it's like those guys, right? It's designed in California, but then we all know where they produce and it's sure. also in China. So sure. it's, yeah. it's, it's the whole the whole yeah storyline. Yeah. Okay. Wow. How long how long do you experience with the campaign run? Uh, so the campaign you're usually gonna want to run it for like thirty to forty five days. Um, and then as far as how long it takes you to actually produce the product and get it to people's doorsteps, that just varies from campaign to campaign. And, you know, if, if you can save them money by, and they only have to wait, you know, if, if you can save them a good chunk of money, or if, especially if you can offer them, offer the United States the product instead of not just, just because just by adding a month and a half of time on the back end. That's. I think that's totally fine. I don't think you're doing yourself any uh, like disservice. Then, as far as what I can see, just based off of these previous campaigns, I'm not sure you're gonna be able to like succeed organically that way. So you'd want to definitely do some lead gen, build an email list of people just you know in the country that you're gonna ship to, and hopefully you can uh, build a big enough audience and get people to convert and have a su yeah. successful campaign that way but yeah that would definitely be more a game of harnessing that audience beforehand a, a, a Europe specific audience is there a difference between Indiegogo and Kickstarter or is it pretty much the same but it's just like Uber and Lyft and Kickstarter is the kind of bigger Uber one <laughs> yeah that's the that's a good way to put it it's just uh okay. it's yeah they're they're pretty similar you can definitely have success on Indiegogo I I think Kickstarter and most people view Kickstarter as the more credible one out of the two, so to speak. Okay, okay, very good. Um, then the, the next question, because that also impacts my whole calculation, and it's also totally random. You know, I, I'm just throwing you really random bits and pieces of information I gathered from all kind of sources. So please feel free to to, to smash everything I tell you. <laughs> so um, sure. so I I was told that. Um, ideally, to get nice sales and to hook people and to you know like make them understand that it's really a great offer they're up, up for, um, it's good to, to 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 hit at least let's say 50% of the of the actual sales price, meaning that um, you yes. know if the recommended retail price would be 999. Euros or dollars, it's, it doesn't matter yet now for all these examples and costs we're talking about, especially because euro and dollar are very close at the moment. Um, then I, I would need it. I would need to hit at least 499 US uh, Kickstarter offer. Is that something you you would tend to agree with? Um, and then that is the question number one, and intrinsically linked to that question, question number two, is it is it then also true that? Is 4.99 in general on Kickstarter, no matter what the final sales price or retail price is, is super important because as soon as there's a five as a first digit, people will be really reluctant to buy it. And 499 is kind of something you still give to you as a treat, but if it's 599, it's I see what you're saying. <clears throat> okay, so I think my first response to these couple questions is probably don't. It, you don't need to be that specific about like cutting your retail price exactly in half. Um, really you just want to whatever your retail price is going to be give them a good discount because that's just part of the Kickstarter environment and platform is like you're giving your money up front for a product that doesn't exist and in return you're getting this new product at a better price than other people are going to have to pay for it once it's on the shelves so you don't have to take the retail and cut it in half but definitely take the retail price and give them a good discount. If you can cut it in half and still make the amount of money that you want to make from the Kickstarter campaign, then yeah, I'm like that's just going to okay. incentivize people more to back the campaign. Gotcha. Um, and then and the, go ahead. No, no, exactly, then the second question. Okay, yeah, the, so, the, remind me real fast what it was. Uh, oh, the 499 or 500. 499 yeah, yeah. or 599 if you would really see it in the number of backers. Um, I mean, it, you absolutely can, right? But I don't think it's because necessarily because they're seeing a four or a five. Like if you're talking about four ninety nine or five ninety nine, I don't think the four or the five is tripping people up. I think it's the hundred dollars extra that's going to trip people up. If you're talking about four ninety nine or five fifteen, 
then I'd say, yeah, probably go 499 because just them thinking yes. over 500 is a bigger thought than 499. So, but if it's, if it's like 499 or 599, like I was saying, I don't think it's the four or the five that's mattering. I think it's that, that you added a hundred dollars there. Um, but if it's 525 or 495, I'd go 495 and just eat that 30 bucks or whatever. Gotcha. I'm just, I'm just trying to find out on the, oh wow, it was on Indiegogo by the way, not on Kickstarter. That's funny. They have, they had a page on both on for Activo Scoot. Do you know how that works? So yeah. Kickstarter one's linking to Indiegogo, it seems. Did you did you did you ever try this? Yeah, so this it's called a um why am I blanking the name right now? Indiegogo uh why am I blanking the name? Uh but yeah, basically you can uh, just how like they did it. Across, you, uh, you can yeah, and you can just continue so once your Kickstarter is over you can, like they did, change your button to link to an Indiegogo in-demand campaign is what it's called. And you can just continue taking pre-orders after your Kickstarter campaign through that Indiegogo page. And it's basically just a copy-paste from Kickstarter to the Indiegogo in-demand campaign. But that type of in-demand campaign is different than if you were to run a raise funds campaign on Indiegogo. Like like from the beat like like a normal Kickstarter campaign. It would probably not be shocking if we put our scooter at five nine nine in there, US, right? Yeah, and I but I wouldn't I wouldn't compare I wouldn't base your pricing so much off of this failed campaign. I'd go look at the ones that have succeeded and that completed, uh, and see what their pricing was, <clears throat> and then kind of use that as the gauge. Okay. So I'll pull some. Up. So let me check. Uh, this one is still running. They say final hours own electric scooter. Is it true? March 2000. Yeah, it's still running. So yeah, this own one they're doing selling for 300. Wow. 360. Okay, but it's also two pack. Is they're selling a two pack for 6.99. It's a shit scooter. The problem, so the problem is, will people understand that it's a shit scooter? You know, it's a that is a big question to ask. I'm looking but at. I the... know it because I, I know it why because it, it has a, a you know like a small. Let me let me check. So the, the wheels are super small. They're not air tires, so you you slip on them. Um, they. Let me see. The battery must be very small. Let me just check the the value of the thing, the actual so, value. So the uh, I'm looking at a different one, the Man Mantor X, <clears throat> the one that's come out of uh, Hong Kong, and they they're selling theirs for oh it's right there yeah like six hundred bucks six hundred twenty bucks. Oh yeah, that is the one that is like self so, rolling. Yeah. yeah, so I think I think you'd be okay in that range. Again, the lower you can go, the better. But yeah, I think that range is. Is doable. So you good. see, your general, uh, the, the general thrust here is that number one, we might have chance to to hit our goal uh, even organically, but uh, or at least a big part of the goal. And then, um, and then number two, of course, you know, if we do lead generation, then this becomes way more realistic. So that's that's what you're saying, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Cool. Let's let's talk about that. I mean, I know you don't have a crystal ball, but just from your experience. Uh, what would be the kind of organic, no lead generation? If we assume we have the perfect homepage, it's it's very rudimentary at the moment. I know you just wanted to get it out there so that if I shoot emails around with my uh, attraction dot domain, that people see what, who we are. You know? um, sure. But let's assume perfect homepage, perfect Kickstarter uh, campaign uh, page, just no no uh, lead generation beforehand, and, and we just put it out there. Uh, <laughs> you, you, you have any any wild guess where we would land? Honestly, I could take a guess, but I honestly hate to hate to do this. <laughs> Sorry, okay. just because like in the end, that's all it is is a guess. I can I can base my guess off of where I see your products fitting against these other products that have succeeded on Amazon, and and say yeah, I think you can make you know fifty, a hundred organic sales. And then you know just multiply that by your price point, and that's how much you made. But 
um honestly like it's just yeah it's just yeah. so it, I, I can't i can't know you know but the, 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 okay. the best i, I can really it. speaks for you you know i prefer you telling me you don't know them and, just... and i say that you know launching products myself creating and launching my own where it's like even those are like let's just see how it goes like I, you do the best you can up front to gotcha. get the product market fit and do your research but in the end you gotta and honestly man i think if you go to someone and they're like oh yeah this is definitely like 115k no problem for sure i think they're bsing you and not you know they're just yeah. trying to make you yeah. feel good to win your business instead of being honest yeah. and i just sure. rather i just rather take a more honest approach but i think uh, based off of the research you know these other campaigns are doing anywhere from like some of the worst ones are doing 50k and then the better yeah. ones are you know into hundreds of thousands so i i think you guys can fit in that range for sure and then if your product really is as is uh as better as you say it is in people's eyes and especially if you put some ad spend behind it then i don't see why you couldn't just keep growing it like i said i have i have some experience with e-scooters i even own my own but i wouldn't say i'm like the the person that's all about it but when i went and watched your video and hearing you talk about disc breaks it's clicking for me man like i'm going yeah like if if it's true that these other scooters don't have real disc brakes and yours does that is a big difference to me like i i would rather have real good brakes and you could even i mean you can really bash on other people's braking systems and put yours up as the superior one inside of your campaign and, and really yeah. make that hit home to people but yeah cool. Okay, all right. Um, and then talking about the lead gen, so I, I just I'm going into my notes here. Um, so you gave a very broad range thinking about lead gen, and I, I, I totally get you. You know, so when we talk about lead, just to, to to summarize, the idea is that we do authentic lead generation, really organically, meaning that we invest into a marketing budget that leads people. Let's say. Uh, to our homepage, and then there's a call for action like subscribe to our newsletter, and every subscription to our newsletter, so somebody that voluntarily gives us their email because they're interested in actually being informed or participating in the campaign, that is what we call a lead, right? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yeah, that is. I would say though, um, just to, and maybe you don't, but this might be a little too much info at this point, but you can do the website where you have the landing page and collect their email there, but you can also collect their email just inside of the Facebook ad itself, so you don't have to send them to any external websites, and that works really well as well. Um, and then I would say, maybe don't make it so much about, hey, sign up for our newsletter, but make it wholly about we're launching on Kickstarter. Give us, you know, give us your email if you want to be notified of when we're launching and if you want to receive more information. But I would, I'd make your lead gen about educating people on you're launching a Kickstarter, and 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 reach out to people who know what Kickstarter is, you know, because if you're if you're putting your ads in front of people who don't know what Kickstarter is and saying, hey, sign up for our Kickstarter, it's not going to work very well. But if you put your ads in front of people who know what Kickstarter is and say, hey, we're launching soon on Kickstarter, throw in your email, we'll send you an email with more info and launch date, then that should work. Okay, gotcha. So you already said it. What would be your main medium or channel to use? You said Facebook. What about Google Ads, for example? So I would say Facebook, Instagram, YouTube ads. Um, you can definitely work, you can definitely try and run some Google, uh, I mean, YouTube ads is Google ads, but uh, as the Google ads that show up in Google, just regular Google searches, um, you know, you can maybe, you can maybe throw a little budget there and see how it goes, but most likely it's going to be Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, that will drive successful conversions on your campaign. Okay, because what I like about, well, I mean... I'm once again, you know, I only have bits and pieces of information from all kind of funny sources. So, but what, what I, I like about Google Ads, at least what I hear, is that it's all, almost and it's never risk-free, you know. But it's, it's almost a, it's a very efficient way to get people because, let's say, if somebody looks for 
safe scooter, you know, or searches uh, Google's uh, scooter disc brakes or scooter big tires, scooter blinkers, directional lights, whatever. And, and I, I, you know, it, it would be very specific. And I always, I'm always in the first position for these kind of search terms. Um, that, and then they, I mean, then I, I, I would assume that the conversa- conversion rate is relatively high, right? Uh, that's um, just going to. Also, de- you only pay for what you get, which I think is a super sexy model. Yeah, so you don't so, get the views only per click. I think you've got a couple of pretty big drawbacks if you're just running search Google search ads. Um, you're right. People are, you know, they have high intent. They type in the product they're looking for, and then if you can pop up. But yours is a new product, so you're going to want to be able to display that product to people, which you can't do through Google search. Yes. And then also, um, you want to again get in front of people who know what Kickstarter is, because if they don't, they're not going to understand at all what's going on. And so, if you're just targeting people through searches that are searching for likely a scooter or a part that they can buy right then and there, and again, if you're redirecting them to a Kickstarter campaign, they're just going to go, "What's going on here?" Um, so, I think those are some pretty big drawbacks to consider. Where Facebook ads, Instagram ads. You can show the video right in front of them. You can select exactly that you want these people to know what Kickstarter is. And then YouTube is where, because and this fits with inside Google, and you might actually really like this a lot. You've got to, you've got to work, the creative is, like you got a more kind of creative video for this. Um, but you can do, so people who are searching those things in Google, when they go onto YouTube to watch videos, doesn't matter what video it is they watched, you can make your video pop up based off of their searches in Google, but you're showing them it, like you're, you're reaching them through those searches on YouTube. Is that making sense? So it's, it's a, what do they call it? Um, intent. So it's like, instead of, it's like Google is collecting metadata about search queries. And then when I'm going on, on YouTube and they push me whatever, every five minutes, these mandatory ads, uh, it will be really targeted to me because, yep. and, and I don't know, if I'm a scooter freak, they will shoot me a scooter video. For yeah, example. so say I just, yeah, exactly. So say I search um, e-scooters in Google, and then later today I jump onto YouTube and I'm watching UFC stuff. Well, when an ad pops up, you could show me a, your scooter video because earlier that day I was searching, searching for scooters on Google. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. that, I would say if you want to go like a search uh search-based type of advertising, I'd, I'd do it that way because you're gonna, because it's based off of their search intent, but you're able to display your product to them in video and you're able to, um, you know, focus that ad on people that already know what Kickstarter is. But, yeah, the, but the that trick there is, sense. the 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 extra work there is that you have to create a good video for people to watch, right? Whereas if you're just running Google search ads, you don't have to create any photos, any videos. It's just like just the text in the little banner, right? So mm. there's all that to, to consider. Okay, I understand. So if we, if we, if we, if we um, talk about conversion rates, so um, so, so let, let, let's, put, let's put it this way. If we get... Uh, and that, these are like probably common numbers, you know. But if if you look at say I don't know uh, one million page impressions, and that resulted into three to six thousand email signups. Uh, out of these three to six thousand email signups, would it possible to convert people into like into sales, hard sales, when the Kickstarter campaign is starting in the first forty-eight hours? So let's say aiming at I don't know 100 or 200 sales to, to, to be boosted as you explained you know in, in this like uh, top category of Kickstarter projects is that something that is uh, that, that is are these numbers right or is, for this kind of expensive products they're wrong or is it is it maybe aiming too high what, what is your feeling about that uh, which numbers exactly so you know, like for example, um, the guy you were talking to in your other video, he was aiming at one million page impressions, uh, resulting in somewhere between three and six thousand oh, email signups, I, so and I would, then resulted in one hundred or two hundred sales. Yeah, so I. 
these are all just estimates, but um, basically, I don't think I don't think page impressions matters. So I would just focus on your leads and then how many of those leads are going to convert. So yeah. however many emails you think you need to collect, 1,000, 2,000, 10,000, whatever it is. And then basically somewhere from 5 to 30% hopefully is going to convert out of your email list. So <clears throat> if you want 200, so if you want, if 200 backers is your goal, then just work backwards and say, you know, how many emails do I need at a 10% conversion rate to get 200 backers? And then you can, uh, you can estimate, yeah. Yeah. sure. And then you can estimate your cost per lead, which is going to be probably, I don't know, like three to eight bucks, probably something like that. Um, so then you just multiply that by however many emails you think you need, which take your 10% conversion rate, and that should give you your. But again, that's all, I mean, you can't know for sure what your conversion rate's going to be. And that's really what it's all going to hinge on is if those people actually convert. And honestly, man, I did. Um, so it can definitely work, but I'm going to give you a story of when this didn't work is because like the lead jam went great. The ads were good, got signups for like 2 to $3 cost per lead, somewhere like up in the $5 range. But I'm just, people were commenting and sharing the posts a lot. Everything looked amazing, but then when we launched, and I, I told this to them beforehand, I was like, I'm pretty sure this price point's just way too high. I'm pretty sure this price point's way too high, and they just kept saying, we can't, it costs X from China, and we, it's, it's what we have to work with. I was like, all right, well, yeah. no one converted. I, I think we got one conversion from our um, lead gen, and so, but 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 that makes sense, though, because right? if the... You can do all the work of getting the lead and sending them to the campaign, but if something's wrong on the campaign, they're not converting. And in that case, it looked like it was, I mean, we were a couple hundred dollars over what was the next, um, like the next competitor's price. And it, ours, in percept, like in people's perception, it, it wasn't like, a two hundred dollar step up or anything like that. So it was just like, and the com and the comments came in like, maybe for three hundred, but not for six hundred type of stuff. And so, wow. um, okay. you, you, so you never really know how it's exactly going to convert. But you know, if your product is good, if you found the right price point, and you are telling the story well, they should convert. Gotcha. So there's two very big question marks here. Question mark number one is. So that's kind of the first step. What is the cost per lead, right? So which is somewhere between. Well, I know you know. It's, it's, I won't. I won't pin you down on that. <laughs> but it, it's somewhere between three and eight US, yeah. according to your experience. Um, and, and once again, I, I won't pin you down on that because I know you. You, you only know when, when you know. <laughs> and then and then there is the conversion conversion rate. Uh, so meaning how many leads to actually convert them into sales, hard sales, which is once again, somewhere between five and 30%. So you never. Sure. Yeah. I mean, maybe so, it could be more, but yeah. The truth is if you're going to do lead gen and, and you, and especially if you're, if you're doing it to really like get some real numbers to boost your campaign, you're spending thousands for sure. Um, unless somehow you get really, really cheap cost per leads. But yeah, I don't, I mean, even at the cheapest, I don't, I mean, I don't think you're going to be getting 80 cent cost per leads, you know? So, um, but then that's also why I wanted to mention, I think your project has some legs for that organic success without, you know, so I, I think there's, there's that, uh, and th again, I'm, this is all talking if you're selling to the U S if this is just, just Europe, then that's a little no, no, different. No, 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 like this, have you ever seen a campaign that dropped in price? while being like on the run during its running time yeah so i think one one strategy that would work well is have a super early bird at maybe your 499 but with limited spots so maybe only open yeah. that up for like 15 20 people and then mm -hmm. have the higher one at 599 and then mm -hmm. you'll be able to pretty clearly see if people backed the 499 filled that up but then no one's backing the 599 then maybe what you want to do is go, okay, we're going to close the 599, open up the 499 and let people back at that level. So you could, you could do that. 
um, a, as a way of dropping the price inside of the campaign. You can always open re new reward levels as the campaign's live. So yeah, you can, you can you can definitely change. You can't go like if you have a reward level that's already sitting there. You can't go in and edit that one once it's once your campaign's live. You can only close it. Um, but then you can open up as many new ones as you want. So you could just open up a new one with with whatever price point, or you could do the, um, yeah, you could do yeah. that, and, and you could base that off of the. You could have your super early bird be a a test price point with a closed number of spots. Okay, gotcha. And how how, how quickly do we get the? Uh, um, and can, can it be the first first on that point? Can it be actually, um, uh, an, can it have a negative impact on buying behavior of future backers if they see, oh shit, I missed the super early bird offer and now I jump from 499 to 599 and they're like, nah, I, w I won't spend a hundred bucks more just because I'm late instead of if we had just put it at 599. Do you, I mean, do you know uh, that? Or? I mean, I'm, my guess is yes, there's going to be some people that do that, but um for the most part, people know that, uh, like, there's you, there's limited spots in the super early bird, and if you don't make it into those, then you've got to pledge at the other ones. And if they want the product, they'll pledge at the other ones, unless you really did cross that barrier of I can afford it now I can't type of a thing. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. as long as as long as that's not what's happening, then it doesn't matter if they miss the super early bird; they'll back at the next level. We lost a lot of money with that coronavirus shit. So we really have a tight budget now. I don't know how, how much we would have, but maybe like just for the marketing, I don't know, two or three K maybe. So we won't get very far with it. If you know, if, if one thousand leads is already potentially five K, that's that sucks. <laughs> so yeah. yeah, that's uh I hear you that's yeah, no that's the game though. Um Mm. Yeah, I, mean, I, I get you. I mean, it's not in your hands entirely. I uh, know. Yeah, and and as far as uh, you know, I'll throw this out there. As far as my compensation goes, I'm not committing one way or the other here. But I will say that I am not on all projects, but on yours, I would be interested in having a discussion of you don't pay me anything up front, but I take a percentage of whatever's raised off the back end. Um, mm -hmm. And the reason that I would be open to having that conversation with you is just because I think there's, I think you're product has legs for success whereas if I kind of don't feel that way like I'm definitely still willing to help people do lead gen and build the campaign and stuff but then I kind of try and transfer that to more okay pay me up front because I just can't be yeah, as confident yeah, yeah. As on the back end you know but in this case I'd be willing to have that conversation about how a uh, back end compensation might be better for you or not 